first thing I want to do is to share with you a little miracle. I have um, the Message Bible uh, under my bed, which has been falling apart for ages. And this week, a page actually fell out of it. And it was 2 Corinthians 4. And I thought, well, that's a sign, because that is amazing. So here I am with a spare page of the Bible on the very message I'm supposed to be speaking on. So, here we go. I'm going to read just a little bit. One of the problems with the message is it doesn't have any um, verse numbers. So it's very hard to know where you are at any time. Um, but I'll just read a bit of this page and then we'll look at it. It has a very unfortunate heading because it's called trial and torture. But we'll ignore that bit and move on. Since God has so generously let us in on what he is doing, we're not about to throw up our hands and walk off the job just because we run into occasional hard times. We refuse to wear masks and play games. We don't manoeuvre and manipulate behind the scenes and we don't trust God's twist, God's word to suit ourselves. Rather, we keep everything we do and say out in the open, the whole truth on display, so that those who want to see can see and judge for themselves in the presence of God. If our message is obscure to anyone, it's not because we're holding back in any way, no. It's because these other people are looking or going the wrong way and refuse to give it serious attention. All they have eyes for is the fashionable God of darkness. They think he can give them what they want and they won't have to bother believing a truth that they cannot see. They're stone blind to the day spring brightness of the message that shines with Christ, who gives us the best picture of God we'll ever get. Remember, our message is not about ourselves. We're proclaiming Jesus Christ, the master. All we are is messengers, errand runners from Jesus for you. It started when God said, light up the darkness and our lives filled up with light as we saw and understood God in the face of Christ, all bright and beautiful. If you only look at us, you might well miss the brightness. We carry this precious message around in the unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. That is to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. As it is, there's not much chance of that. You know for yourselves that we're not much to look at. We've been surrounded and battered by troubles, but we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. What they did to Jesus, they do to us. Trial and torture, mockery and murder. What Jesus did among them, he does in us. He lives. Our lives are at constant risk for Jesus' sake, which makes Jesus' life all the more evident in us. Whilst we're going through the worst, you're getting in on the best. And as our volunteers used to say at Stella Carmel in Israel, well, that speaks for itself. So. Okay. Oh, no. right. That's what they used to say at seven in the morning when they hadn't prepared for the morning devotion that they were leading. And they'd just read a passage of scripture and say, I think that speaks for itself. And then they'd sit down. But this is such a great passage. And I thought I'd just look at a few um, bits of it and bits that I've uh, written down from it. In John 3.19, it says, Light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Now, I don't know if you thought your deeds were evil before you came to know Christ, or perhaps you were brought up in a Christian home and never had any problems of sin or anything like that. The problem I had was that I came to know the Lord when I was 30, and I thought I was quite nice. I mean, I did things wrong, but I mean, don't we all? My things weren't any worse than anybody else's, and if they were, well, that was balanced out by some things I did that were lesser than other people, so it was okay. 
And then I came to know Christ, like Jenny, just by saying yes. And that's when my problems began. Because you see, he shone light into my darkness and I discovered how incredibly dark darkness can be. And I became overwhelmed with the fact that God could love someone like me. And he does, and he does for you too. The God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbelievers and they become his servants and his slaves. And I don't know if you've, you know, got, we probably have people that you know that are walking in darkness and they're following the prince of this world. And he picks them up and he drops them down. And he has no love, no compassion, just cruelty to use people as his puppets. You wouldn't want to be a puppet of the prince of this world, I hope, because there's no mercy. And come instead to Jesus, who is all merciful and all loving. We're talking here, it said in the message, about people who are looking or going the wrong way. And I heard somewhere, I don't know whether it was here or at a conference, that if, say, Jesus is at the back by the font, near where Roger and Margaret and Elizabeth are sitting, of course, if he was there, you wouldn't be sitting there. You'd be flat on your faces in wonder and awe. But for the sake of this, he's standing there. And there are those people that in their life have moved closer and closer and closer to him. And then they've turned their back. And then there are some people who are way, way back over there. Way, way back. But you know what? They're facing him. And they're moving slowly but surely towards him. And I think we need to notice those people who haven't turned their backs, who are moving closer and closer, and then do everything we can through love and prayer to see them move and actually meet, as Pete said, with the one who is the source of all creation. You think about when you can see light the most clearly. Is it in the bright sunshine at midday? or in the darkness of the night and it's in the darkness of the night that you can see more clearly when we were in Israel uh, we used to go to uh, Tel Aviv and stay with friends in their little bungalow when it got a bit too much running a hundred bed, hundred bed conference centre where guests arrived and stayed for days and You'd get really overwhelmed and tired. Then we'd trail off to Tel Aviv and we'd stay in this bungalow with our friends. They had an amazing plant in their front garden. I've got no idea of the name of it and I used to have a photograph of it. It's beautiful. It used to come out and flower in bright yellow. But the amazing thing about this plant is that it only flowered at night time. And as night came, it opened up and it flowered. And as the daylight started to come, it closed up again. And I got this quotation I've written down. Anyone can sing when the sun is shining. But if you can still sing at midnight, the world will hear you in a different way. I thought that was beautiful. So we don't have to worry that when things go wrong, it sort of spoils everything. For some of us, we have a view of God that isn't really right. In fact, actually, it's wrong. Something goes wrong and we say, well, God, I thought you loved me. So why is this happening? As though God's some Father Christmas in the sky that just waves a little wand around and everything's fine. 
Life is full of difficulties, and I would say, I don't know you all, but I know a lot of you, life has not been easy. There are no guarantees of easiness, but there is a guarantee. God says, I love you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never walk out on you. I will be with you always to the very end of time. And that's our guarantee. It's actually our only guarantee. It says, if you think differently than that, it says, then go back to the recruiting office and have a chat with whoever signed you up because you signed up wrong. Your Christian life and commitment is not a free pass through life. Stuff happens and we become cracked clay pots. Does it matter? No. More light can shine through a cracked clay clay pot than it can through one that's perfectly sound sealed and looks good are we under pressure yes do we get confused sometimes yes do we face harsh criticism yes are we knocked down sometimes? Yes. And in the Message Bible, it said something that I, I really loved. Because it says, we've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. And I don't know if any of you ever saw that program with Sean Penn, Bean, whichever, called Broken, on the television about a priest. And it was just amazing because there was so much wrong in his life. And he thought he wouldn't be any good to the people. And yet he was, you see, because he'd been there, he'd done that. He'd had some awful experiences. And at the end of the day, the people could love him more because, like them, but he hadn't been actually broken beyond repair and I'd like to suggest that we here today we haven't been broken beyond repair but there are some cracks there are cracks for light to shine through um, we know of somebody and this might sound amusing but it isn't and if this is like you then I hope you won't be offended um, but we know somebody who went on holiday to Israel for the first time and so then they were going to the Holy Land you see it wasn't just Israel it was the Holy Land and when they were at Caesarea Philippi they put their uh, rucksack down with all their money and their passport and everything and then wandered off to take some photographs and the most amazing thing happened because the rucksack got stolen when this person came home they were in a real state and in fact they couldn't go into work for a little while because you see everything about their Christianity and their base had been shaken up because you see it was the holy land and bad things can't happen there to to Christians now that's an example but for us here we have to think when some things go wrong do we think God don't you love me anymore? Or God, where are you? Or what are you doing? Because their basis isn't firm and it isn't secure. And you can build up a sort of theology of who God is according to who you want him to be, not who he is. God is God. He isn't reduced to the person that I would like him to be to suit my needs. And so, when I look at all this passage, which I really, really love, I have to think, for us today, do we acknowledge that we're only clay pots, that we're not much to look at? And we might not be very skillful or clever or intelligent or anything at all like that, but we are deeply, deeply loved by God. And what he wants is to use us, weak feeble as we are for his kingdom in these days 
And even when we're knocked down, we're not broken because he is able to lift us up again and use us. And we have this treasure in pots of clay. It's a treasure to know God. It's a treasure to have the power of the Holy Spirit living in each one of us. It's a treasure. I bought um, three necklaces outside um, Harrods once many years ago. They were gold, solid gold, and there were three for ten pounds. I thought, well, that's a bargain. So I bought them. But do you know what? They weren't real, and they all tarnished, and I had to throw them away. <laughs> but we have a treasure that doesn't tarnish. We don't have to throw away, and he'll never throw us away, because he loves us. Amen. Oh, <laughs>